Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to briefly thank everyone for all their hard work, but it's all come culminating in this final moment. Our final pitches are about to begin. Um, and just really quickly, I know I've introduced them already before, but these are the four amazing judges that we've invited today. Um, so first we have Dr. Alice Herrera, who is a sustainable energy management professional with 30 plus years of experience in sustainable energy management and conservation demand management. In particular, she was the president of the Energy Efficiency Practitioners Association of the Philippines and was the head of the Fuels and Energy Division of the Industrial Technology Development Institute in Manila. Um, next, we have Dr. Ruby Sulan, who is an assistant professor and lauded researcher at the University of Toronto in the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences and the Department of Chemistry. Her research is on mechanomicrobiology and material biosystems interactions. At UTSC, she teaches courses including the react reactions and mechanisms and topics in biophysical chemistry. Um, next, we welcome Izzy Calder, who is a partner, lawyer, and patent agent with Bearskin and Parr here in Toronto. She is a co-leader of the firm's artificial intelligence practice group and helps technology clients build patent portfolios for a wide variety of electrical, computer, and mechanical-related inventions. She's a frequent speaker and supporter of the Toronto technology community, working with um, institutions such as the Entrepreneurship Hatchery and the Impact Center at U of T. Last but not least, we welcome Lisa Cole, who is the Director of Programming for the K-21 Academy at the Lausanne School of Engineering at York University. She is an award-winning high school physics teacher and former president of the Ontario Association of Physics Teachers. She has experience providing teacher workshops, consulting on teacher resource development, and developing multi-stakeholder partnerships. So thank you so much to our four judges. Um, again, they're dedicating three hours of their time to watch 13 groups. So um, we, warm them, we welcome them warmly um, before we are now um, beginning. So without further ado, I will let in the first team. Um, so starting out, um, we have our first team, which is team 11 or Sandy Cheeks. So, um, Sandy Cheeks, whenever you guys are ready, you should have permission to share screen, so you may begin the presentation. Um, wait, I think our team leader isn't up yet. Okay, okay, she's connecting, so. <laughs> I think Jai can start presenting. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, we are Team 11, and this is our project, Sandy Cheeks. Our sustainable science project is inspired from the fact that the Philippines lies on the Pacific Ring of Fire, which makes it extremely prone to earthquakes, with approximately 2,000 earthquakes every year. As a result, liquefaction remains as a constant cause of concern for the residents. Our goal is to show the effects of liquefaction on various structures and educate youth about earthquake prevention techniques. With earthquakes comes much destroyed architecture, most notably homes. Therefore, we want to help these underprivileged adolescents gain the necessary skills to combat their environmental difficulties in a reliable and sustainable way. So the, all, all the materials we're using are low cost and easily accessible. And this is one of the houses we, one of the three houses we built using popsicle sticks, sticks, tape, and a hot glue gun. And our project involves two experiments. For the first experiment, we test different effects of liquefaction under different sand compositions. For our second experiment, we test varying house structures against liquefaction from one sand composition. And that one sand composition is the strongest sand composition from experiment one. So here's what you should do. First, you should build a house, which I already built. And then you add the sand with 120 mils of water and a, handle, and a handful of pebbles, which I already did. And then you place this whole container under a skateboard or just a flat surface with wheels. And then you just start shaking it for around 10 seconds. And as you shake, take qualitative notes to describe the house's reaction to the earthquake simulation. And also take quantitative notes on the time it took the house to fall down. The materials we chose can all be found locally for either very low prices or none at all. We researched and put into consideration the resources that would most likely be available in the environment of our audience and made sure that all items are realistic and easy to use in a classroom. This helps us tie back to the sustainability and environment consideration of our project. 
We also took into consideration of the materials used to make the smaller models of the houses in our experiment and how this may differ from the actual materials used to make houses in the community. We ensured that our choices could be easily replicated in a much larger model, making our solution and project both realistic and beneficial for the students, allowing them to use the knowledge and results from the project and apply it to their daily lives. Our project is relevant to the students as the Philippines are quite susceptible to tropical weather and earthquakes, seeing that the country resides closely to the Philippine plate. Because of these factors, liquefaction is a highly recurring problem, especially in areas where the foundation of the ground may not be as strong as other areas. By showing students how the structure and composition of the building can have a significant effect on its ability to withstand liquefaction, students may use this knowledge to understand the structure of their own homes and hopefully aim to improve the building structures in their communities in the future. So a success throughout this experiment can be measured through a following criteria. Uh, the students enjoy and are actively engaged throughout the experiment. The students understand the concept behind the liquefaction. So in that case, why it is a danger, why it occurs, and understand the soil types that affect the different intensities of liquefaction. The students will also uh, understand how the building design can deter severe damage. And in the case uh, that some materials can't be accessed, we do have a lot of alternatives uh, written in the materials list. We have some reflections based on our experience with the project. So our major accomplishments include successfully designing three different house structures with varying strength against liquefaction and demonstrated liquefaction of the sand during earthquake. Our room for improvement is that the houses we made by hand don't have the best quality since we are inexperienced in handcraft and we spend too much time building the house. And next time we will change the materials used to create the house, which may reduce the time it consumes. And for example, we may use a thin piece of wood instead of uh, assemble a slime made of popsicles, uh, popsicle sticks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions from our judges? So I have a quick clarification. Um, so you did change the structure of the house, you said like three times. So what, what are the different materials you use? So you showed one that to be popsicles. Um, what are the two others again? We use, we all use popsicle sticks. However, the house structure itself is different. Uh, okay, and we oh, sure. okay. included the design of the, in the teacher's the, manual. The third okay. house we built. And then the second yeah. house basically does not have the base. And then the first house does not have the base and these four. Um, oh, so it's the structure that's made up of the same popsicle material, correct? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, okay, Good. clear. Okay. Uh, Different uh, structures another... of the same material. Okay, and yeah. just another um, related question. Um, did you vary the underneath? Like you said, you put it on top of the pebble, correct? Um, what was the the foundation of the where you you put the house like? So really, what's underneath the, the house? Okay, so so like for the first experiment, we tested we used house one. We used the same house to test different sand compositions, and then we find we found out that the sand with water and some pebbles is the strongest. So we used that sand with the pebbles and the water for experiment two. So in experiment two, we used this sand plus water and pebbles with three different house structures. Structure, okay, I see. Okay, okay. yeah, thank you. So you first optimize the, the sand and water yeah. underneath and then from there you, you yeah. use it for the two other structures. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. How is Lisa or Izzy? Yeah, uh, it's Lisa, um, question. Um, so I'm, ki I'm understanding now uh, what kinds of variables you were kind of exploring in designing your activity. Uh, so I'm now wondering from a lesson point of view, um, how, how are you thinking that um, a teacher would be using the activity um, to kind of get to the learning uh, outcomes that you are designing this activity for. So in, I, I'm still not clear 
uh, from what you've described. What are the specific learning outcomes that your activity is intended to get at? And how, is, how have you constructed the lesson that allows the teacher to guide that learning to reach those outcomes based on what you've discovered um, in, your, in your activity? So uh, with our first experiment, um, we play around with a different soil composition. And what this teacher can do with this is talk about how uh, varying amounts of water will affect the soil. Um, in that case, they can talk about um, the soil pressure. Um, they can also talk about how, if we, in, if we have pebbles in there, um, how this will affect uh, the resonance. So this is sort of covering physics, but the seismic activity of the uh, sort of shaking of the sand and how that will sort of interfere with the resonance and probably prevent uh, like the intense amount of liquefaction. Um, uh, we made our focus on the buildings because during one of our last meetings, um, we were told that our project had to relate to the students' lives as well. So our project had to be um, like relevant to the students. So therefore we changed our, um, our focus of our project from the foundation of the ground, which is still the main uh, uh, scientific lesson for it. But however, we changed it to a little bit uh, focus more on the building structure because that's a lesson that it can be applied to the students' daily activities and it's relevant to the students. So we put into consideration the different like buildings, so how you build your buildings and how that could play an effect on how well it can withstand between liquefaction and earthquakes. Thank you, team. Um, you did a great job. I uh, and uh, we're ready for the next team. So uh, thank you very much. We'll see you at the closing ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And judges can use this transition time to enter your scores, please. Okay. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yep. yep so the next good. team is now entering. We'll let you know when you can start. Okay. Thank you. Give some judges a bit of time. Can I start sharing my screen first? Yeah, yeah you, you can, you can get that up uh, and ready. Sure. Um, on Thank the you. chat, I will give you a uh, one minute warning. Um, sure. And then at the five minute uh, mark, when the time is up, I will talk to you. I will interrupt you, I mean. OK, thank you. Eric, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just waiting on one more score. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so we are now welcoming uh, group 12. May I start or do I still have to wait for? Start. Whenever you're ready, you can okay. start. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Henry, and I'm the team leader for Team 12. And I'll be talking about Team to our project for the 2020 Hackathon for Science Education, hosted by, hosted by Pueblo Science. For a start, the title of our project is Asymptomatic Disease Transmission Demo by Acid Based Chemistry. We decided to do a chemistry focused project for this event because all of our members in our team have relevant, have relevant backgrounds. We came up with this idea when discussing about COVID-19. As you know, unlike, <clears throat> unlike SARS or MERS, a lot of the patients for the novel coronavirus are asymptomatic and they look perfectly normal from the outside. This represents a difficult challenge when you want to track down potential carriers of the uh, pathogen and to contain the virus. 
So we hope to create a demonstration to show the significant impact of asymptomatic patients in a population and really just teach students chemistry related knowledge through fun activities. For the first instruction period, students and teachers will be making a pH indicator solution by boiling red cabbages leaves. We chose red cabbage um, because it's it should be readily available and it's a plant-based plant renewable, um, <clears throat> re renewable resource um, that is in line with um, the UN's sustain one of the UN's sustainability development goals. Uh, and the test sample solutions will be made by dissolving washing soda in distilled water, which makes the solution basic. And uh, you can see on the bottom left corner, uh, there's a clear color change uh, depending on the pH of the solution. Uh, the core of the demo is very simple. We'll give all students in the class a cup half filled with a transparent liquid. This can be either water or sodium carbonate solution. Students will then start walk around freely in the classroom, and whenever they bump into each other, they have to mix and divide the solution before separating. They will repeat this until they are called in for a test with the, the indicator solution. We designed this um, demo with a great flexibility in mind. Uh, yeah. Older students can do chemistry calculations, sample preparations, and even some statistical analysis. For younger students, this will be a really fun um, game that introduces the concept of disease transmission, specifically in the case of asymptomatic symptoms, uh, asymptomatic diseases. We can also imagine some alternative, alternative scenarios. For example, we can limit the number of people each student can bump into everyone or tell everyone to get tested immediately after each mixing event occurs. In these scenarios, uh, we can introduce other concepts such as math um, for exponential growth and social distancing measures impact. <clears throat> uh, uh, yeah, so in terms of the impact, obviously our activity will not cure the novel coronavirus and our other diseases, but we hope that students will keep this at the back of their mind. When they, when every time they make a decision, for example, maybe they would learn not to walk around without face coverings. They would choose not to go to parties, even though all the attendants seem to be healthy, and to get tested if available and when necessary. They can also share key concepts with families and friends, which can greatly reduce the risk of exposure for everybody. And for the live demo part of this presentation, I, obviously we can't get fifty students to come in to do a presentation. And so Leo will be, our teammate Leo will be um, showing you how the color change of our pH indicator works. Leo, can you do? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you see the camera? Yes. Okay, so uh, the, the pH indicator made from red cabbage has been done uh, in advance as well as the uh, sodium carbonate solution because that would uh, took longer time uh, and we don't have that much time. So uh, this is a, a pH indicator from from the pod just so, uh, just a scene. So, and we have a uh, virus of uh, concentration of, uh, of the sodium carbonate. And this this one is for the vinegar, just for comparison. And yeah, this one is can... just, the, just the indicator. Just, just so add I'll, it. Yeah. yeah. You can see uh, this is the lowest concentration and this is the highest concentration. And you can see this uh, very slight color change uh, from here. And this is the solution we use to uh, we use you. for this active. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Your time is up. Um, judges, uh, any questions for group 12? Is your Alice? You didn't get to ask a question last time. Sure, sure. It's Izzy here. Um, I think that's a really compelling uh, um, experiment that you've designed there. I guess my question would be, you know, what is what you know, and a question that was sort of asked last time. What are the learning goals, or how how would you anticipate um, 
the sort of the results would be understood and comprehended by the students that have engaged in the experiment. What what was what's your vision for the for sort of the the reflection period after the experiment, and how would that be done? Yeah. So um, the the curriculum that is relevant to our demo is um, acid based chemistry in general, and we have a number of um, of um, concepts that are specifically written. Um, that students should understand or can learn about in our teacher's manual. Uh, for example, depending on the number of students that are um, involved in this activity, we um, we presented them a simple calculation of how to calculate what concentration of washing soda you might need to prepare for uh, to to result to get a final pH of a specific value, and we we think that this will. Um, Letting students to do these calculations would um, would definitely help their learning. Um, for COVID specifically or disease transmission, unfortunately, I don't think they have this as a part of their curriculum. At least we try to look that up. But in general, we believe that having an understanding that just because um, everyone looks fine in a uh, in in your community doesn't mean that they're necessarily safe. And I think that that would definitely uh, that. As long as they keep this in mind, they can um, reduce the risk of um, contracting disease for everyone in the population. Mm -hmm. Good synergy there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned something in your discussion that you, you know, you you can do some sort of an experiment with the students, like going around the classroom, I guess, or perhaps I have not. You know, heard everything, but yes, that, that is you'll correct. be asking the students to go and you know when they bump each other. Uh, yeah. What is that? You know, what's the significance of that in the experiment? So, a bumping whenever they bump into each other, it represents a um, potential exposure uh, and an exposure to potential carriers because uh, the the liquid that they carry in their cup is all clear, and they don't mm -hmm. necessarily know whether the other person has a pure, distilled water in their cup mm -hmm. or has a basic solution in their cup. When oh, they okay. mix together, yeah, it represents it, it's a um, it's our way of presenting and potential exposure, even mm -hmm. though they all look clear, it's still like it, it's still a transferring event. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. We have a time for one short question, if there are any. Um, I have one. Uh, you, you've been referring to doing calculations and yes. um, uh, I'm just wondering if you could explain that further, like, what kind of calculations are you imagining that the students so, would be asked to do? Yes. So one of the, for example, one of the calculations that are um, that we presented is the idea of solubility. Depending on the temperature of the ambient environments, so, um, the solubility of um, sodium uh, sodium carbonate uh, changes in solution, and that would change how they can achieve the same uh, the same result that we want to show. Um, another example of the calculation is, for example, how much more sodium carbonate do you need if instead of having 50 students, for example, they now have 500 uh, for 100 students, for example, 100 students, because that will represent a more dilution um, than our initial set of 50 students, in which case the final pH might not, the, the change in final pH might be more significant than you expect. And it, will, it might be harder to distinguish between uh, whether someone has exposure, has exposed to um, a, the disease or not, in which case they will have to make adjustments to the setup. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, it's time for the next team to come up. So I'll see you all at the final closing ceremonies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And I'll ask the judges to use this time to enter their scores. The next team that's coming in is Team Infinity. Although they're number eight, so turn that sideways. Hello, welcome to Infinity. I think we might be able to be ready. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when, yeah. Oh, okay. Can you guys uh, hear me properly? Yeah, and you should have permission to share screen. So if you want to start doing that now, you can. Oh, okay. Uh, we don't have slides for this uh, pitch, okay. so we'll just yeah stick with. Um, although one thing I'd like to know at some point, um, Hey Chen screen will have our live demo component. So I'll have a cue directing you guys to him. Okay. 
but for now, we can just focus on uh, the speech component. OK, anytime you want, you can start. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt. And on behalf of Team Infinity, our project is titled Solar Cooking for Sustainability. We firmly believe that climate change is the biggest issue that humanity is facing in this 21st century. We aspire to bring about awareness for the importance of taking climate action and to also introduce creative new ways of utilizing renewable clean energy as opposed to hazardous environmentally dangerous alternatives. Specifically with our project, Solar Cooking for Sustainability, we hope to teach students in the Philippines about the importance of combating climate change, while also being able to demonstrate the potential of using solar energy as a clean, renewable energy source for completing simple, everyday tasks. Now, specifically with our activity, we hope for students to have the chance to design and build their own solar cookers. And this is really as a means to introduce them to the potential of using solar cooking. By the end of the activity, we even hope that they can heat up or perhaps even cook some of their food items of choice. So in terms of our actual education plan, we hope to address three main concepts. The first of which is obviously climate change. We hope to focus on the greenhouse effect as that is a central concept behind our solar cookers. We'll also talk about physics, namely light and optics and the law of reflection. This is also quite central to the design of our solar cookers. And finally, we'll also talk about thermochemistry, dealing with variables such as specific heat capacity, temperature change, mass, in order to work through some mathematical equations that the students can help solve. Now, in terms of our actual solar cooker, the materials needed are quite cheap and they're very easy to acquire. The materials include a cardboard box, preferably recyclable, some aluminum foil, some saran wrap, a black piece of construction paper, and a metal can or some other cooking vessel. And this preferably is also something recyclable. So now I'd like to direct your attention to Hei Chen's screen where he has our completed prototype. I'll walk you guys through some of the components of this solar cooker. So you'll see that the cardboard box really serves as the container, the exterior of the solar cooker. And on the inside of the box, we have aluminum foil lining all of the walls as well as the flaps of the box itself. So we'll then place a piece of black construction paper at the bottom of the box and then put on top of this a metal can. This of course is our cooking vessel and it could be replaced by another form of recyclable material. We'll then put a layer of saran wrap on the very top of the box. So you can see that these designs are very simple. They're very straightforward and easy to make. And so with our activity, we hope that it'll last a length of two days. As preparation ahead of the first day, we hope that teachers can build their own solar cooker as a prototype to really show the students what the end result will be. The additional purpose of this prep is for teachers to allow their own cookers to preheat for the entirety of day one. That's to ensure that by the end of day one, students can actually have some food items that they can preferably consume after cooking in the solar cooker. Now, in terms of day one itself, students will enter and be introduced to the solar cooker project, and then they'll get a lesson in the law of reflection. This, as I mentioned, is very central to the concept behind our solar cooker's design. And we'll also have a small activity to really let them understand this concept. Afterwards, they'll have the chance to build their own solar cooker. And by the end of class, hopefully the teacher will be able to prepare some sort of food item, assuming their cooker has reached an adequate temperature. For example, maybe something simple like a quail egg omelet. Now it's on day two that students will have the chance to use their own solar cookers to prepare a nice tea beverage. Students will come in and have water inside of their metal cans. And throughout the day, they'll be able to take measurements from these cans and apply concepts of thermochemistry, dealing with calculations of energy transfer, specific heat capacity, et cetera. Now, in terms of the end of the day, hopefully the, they'll be able to use their cans and prepare some nice refreshing tea for everyone to enjoy. They'll also discuss climate change throughout the day, namely the greenhouse effect. So with our project, we really hope to address two SDGs, goal 13 and goal seven. And these are to take climate action and to really emphasize the importance of renewable clean sources of energy. We hope to bring awareness to the topic of climate change and the importance of combating it. And we truly hope to inspire the students to develop creative ways of using these renewable sources of energy. With the knowledge of solar cooking, we truly hope to provide the Philippines with an alternative renewable source of energy that allows them to have a brighter and sustainable future. Thank you very much for listening. 
Are there any questions? Thank you. Good timing. Yeah, question for you with regards to the, uh, you know, you have a very good solar cooker uh, design, but, you know, is it part of your experiment to let the teachers know how to use that solar cooker? Like, do they need to do it outside? And, you know, how much sun do they need to have so that they can produce the heat that they need to cook or, or warm a, uh, you know, uh, a kind of water? And the second question is, how would you really demonstrate that greenhouse effect? So I can speak a bit on the first question. Um, in terms of the weather conditions, as you mentioned, that's definitely something that uh, is something that needs to be planned out beforehand, ensuring that there's adequate sunlight, not too cloudy. Uh, but really, the main thing we're really emphasizing is that there's adequate time for the solar cookers to preheat. And so that's part of why we want the teachers to do the prep so that they can place the solar cookers outside on a sunny day well ahead of when the class actually begins. And then by doing so, by the end of the class, the solar cookers will have reached an adequate temperature. So that's really, I think, the addressment for the first question. Uh, in terms of the second question, is there, um, would one of you like to take it? Or I can also take it if, uh, if need, okay. Uh, so in terms of the actual greenhouse effect, we would like to place the saran wrap as a way of really trapping the heat inside so that once the light rays enter, bounce all around with the aluminum foil walls, the saran wrap will prevent some amount of heat from escaping as uh, Hei Chen has demonstrated. Thank you. Um, to add on to that, I just wanted to mention that on the second day, the teacher, they'll be doing their demo with or by heating up the water, but they won't be adding saran wrap, whereas the, the students will. So by looking at the difference in temperature increase by the end of the day, the students will then know, oh, if you have saran wrap, there's like this added effect of global warming because of the saran wrap. But then the teachers want to just be straight up without the saran wrap. There's no global warming effect. Thank you. Other judges, we have time for questions. Hi there, I'm Izzy. Um, I just, uh, I think it's wonderful that you've taken this holistic approach um, to, to sort of teaching about climate change and, and the chemistry involved in that. Um, I was wondering, um, are you planning or are there any real world examples of a, like an implementation of the solar cooker that you could show the students? Um, it, it's, it's nice that they can kind of get a, something that they can play with, but are there any real world implementations that you could point to that you're aware of? I can answer this question if that's okay with everyone. So yeah, solar cookers definitely are a real thing and there's a huge variety of commercial options uh, with a huge range in price as well, but some of the higher end ones can cook dozens of meals at a time. And they're very popular in the Southern United States, for example. So yes, there's absolutely a lot of great examples actually of a variety of designs. So that could be a chance to reinforce some different physics concepts as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess that would be a great place to look in terms of enhancing some of the concepts if, if you can learn anything from the real world versions. That's, that's uh, wonderful that I could learn that today. Thank you. <laughs> Ruby? Yeah, so I'm just curious. I, I like the idea and the concept, but have you actually tried it? Like just heating it? Like in terms of um, how I, I know it will vary and I can tell you already in the Philippines on a summer day or it's pretty much summer all throughout, you have a really high temperature. It's like a giant oven, one of my friends call it. Um, but have you actually tried it in, I, I guess I just want an estimate of like how long will it take? What temperature did you achieve? So how have you had the chance to, to do that? Uh, in terms of the, uh, the food without we actually cook, I can answer that. Uh, unfortunately, since we live in Canada at the moment and it's fall, it's really cold outside. We haven't uh, been able to actually cook anything inside. But just by the me measuring the temperature easily goes up to 40, but then uh, considering that it'll be in Philippines in a, su in a summer hot weather, it'll likely to go up to at least 50, according to many online sources. Uh, in terms of uh, the types of food we can cook, uh, it looks like eggs, uh, maybe quail eggs, something small, and we can thin it out. And it was found that the eggs denat the proteins denature at around 55 minutes and they can be fully cooked in about 20 minutes. And we have enough time for that during the session while we do the demonstration and the lesson. Okay, yeah, good, good to hear. Yeah, there's some numbers to how it can be used. Okay, thank you, Hei Chen. Thank you very much. Um, we're ready for the next group. So uh, I'll see you all at the closing ceremony. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. The judges can enter your score.
So the next group is team so number four. I am now letting Hello. in team Max Potential into the room. Um, you guys should have permission to share screen and uh, if you want to put that up now. But Leo will give you the thumbs up when the judges are ready for me. Um, Aria, do you want to share the screen? Yeah, so I'm sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so I'll just start whenever, right? I'll let you know when you can start. I'm just waiting okay. on one more score. There we go. Uh, so you may begin when you like. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so my name is Arya, um, and I'm here with my colleagues as part of Max Potential. And our group's idea is about oil spill treatment using plant-based sorbents. So every year uh, we have uh, quite a few oil spills that occur overseas and it's very detrimental to the marine ecosystems. We see that the lives underwater, the species and the coral reefs are very suffering, are suffered by these catastrophes. And not just that, but individuals that, and that depend on water as a source of income also suffer. And so it was our group's idea to come up with a way where we can separate oil from water. And using plant-based sorbents, we were able to kind of come up with this very eco-friendly way of separating oil from water, which will allow us to better the life below water. It will allow us to kind of clean up after ourselves in the future, and at the same time, provide very san uh, sanitation uh, purposes to allow for clean water in the future. And during the experiment, the kit that we have prepared is focusing around chemistry. And so some of the core competencies that students will be able to learn will be focusing around intermolecular forces of liquids and gases and solids. So um, this is the material list for the experiment. I want to highlight that we're using recyclable plastic water bottles. And for the three sorbents, we're choosing corn husk, coconut husk, and rice straw. We chose those because they're abundant in the Philippines. They're cheap and biodegradable. They're usually considered as waste products. We want the students to understand that there's a hidden value in the conventionally viewed waste products that have a potential to treat oil spill problems. So right now I'm gonna pass on to Sushi who will do a live demonstration of how it works. Uh, yeah, so here's what students will have to do in the experiment. So first- um, uh, we... Sushi there. Hello? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Hello? Yep. Yep. yep, we can hear yes. you. Yeah, yes, yeah. You can. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, so here, uh, here for our experiment, students will have to cut the finish and the sh shoulder portion of two identical water bottles and then calculate yep, the yep. of the yep. total total volume of water. This will be used as the total volume for oil and water mixture. So in this case, our total volume of water bottle was 500 ml. Uh, and the one fourth portion was 125 ml. Uh, the oil and water should have one is to four ratio. So in this case, we had 100 ml of water and 25 ml of oil. And then again, students will have to measure the initial height of the water and of the oil. So in this case, our height of water is 3.4 centimeter and height of oil is uh, 0.8 centimeter. And the total height of this uh, mixture is 4.2 centimeters. So then we will slowly pour this mixture through our sorbent, which is coconut husk in circular motion. And give it about two minutes for phase uh, separation to occur. And then we can measure the height of the separated solution and see how much oil and water was absorbed. So I would like to pass this uh, till the time phase separation occurs. I would like to uh, pass this uh, on to my colleague, Carl, uh, Margaret. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I just um, got this connection. Can you hear me now? Yep, you can go. Oh? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can somebody reply? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, cool. So, um, so the t okay, so the students are expected to fill out their data in, in table one, and they have to calculate the percentage of oil absorbed and percentage of clean water filtered. So the higher percentage of both the absorbed oil and clean water, the better the sorbents. Next slide. Um, 
Next slide. <laughs> Wait, did you change? Aria? Wait, can you hear me? We can hear you. Slide has changed. Losing time. All right. I've paused your time and I'll give you 30 seconds after you resume, okay? Yeah, I think she disconnected. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I think I can um finish it. I'll just cover up. Yeah, I'll just cover okay. up for it. So if yeah. I, you have 30 seconds. Uh can I resume? I'm not sure. It says my screen sharing has been paused in there. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, so um okay, so I'll just continue. So basically what, what she was about to say is that after we do part one of this experiment where we find the best possible sorbent, we would cut this the sorbent in, in quarters and then in, into thirds and then kind of redo the experiment to see how surface area affects this, the, the absorption of capabilities. And then we'll fill out this table again and um, compare which one was better. Mm -hmm. So the bio-based sorbents used in this experiment undergo the absorption process to separate oil water mixture, which is a combination of both absorption and absorption. And to understand this mechanism, we use this opportunity to incorporate the learning outcomes expected through this experiment. By this, we first introduce different types of intermolecular forces, as well as some intramolecular that participate in the properties of water, oil, as well as the interaction between both. Then we demonstrate how Sorry, this concept- your time is up. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so it's time for questions. Uh, Lisa, mm -hmm. do you have one to start with? Yeah, I feel like uh, you didn't quite get to uh, <laughs> finishing uh, finishing your 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 idea. So we're into questioning time. So I guess I'm just wondering what are the uh, sort of scientific outcomes that you intended this activity to be designed for, uh, giving you a little bit of time to maybe finish some mm -hmm. of your thoughts. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh. Caroline, yeah, I think she is. Oh, okay. So again, the main learning competency is to kind of uh, look at the intermolecular forces that are involved in the mechanism of our uh, absorption process. So first, if you look at the slide um, under the discussion, um, I first talk, I first kind of propose the general mechanism of um, how the absorption process works. So it's both absorption and absorption. So then I kind of briefly kind of explain that. And then I go into kind of the whole intramolecular, intramolecular forces, the cause of hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, um, that is, uh, that happens in the water oil model. And also kind of briefly mention the chemical makeup of the sorbents. Um, after that, I mean, the mechanism is more thoroughly explained in the teacher's manual. But just to kind of overgeneralize, um, this is just kind of like the, the key concepts and kind of the base uh, understanding that is needed to understand the mechanism. And then so then I go into um, the chemical structure of the cellulose material. More specifically, it's the lignin part that uh, we are relying on to, uh, do, to do its job. Um, so we found that the higher percentage of lignin the better it's able to um, uh, interact with oil because lignin is hydrophobic. So then we would allow more oil to diffuse into the pores of the sorbent material. And then I also kind of uh, made an illustration of the intramolecular forces that's kind of uh, um, happening between the, the hemicellulose cellulose, which is the two other biomass components of the um, of the cellulose space sorbents. Um, and so you can see that there's like hydro hydrogen bonding with the hydroxy groups of uh, the hemicellulose cellulose uh, structure and with the water. Um, and because lignin also kind of varies, uh, the chemical makeup of lignin kind of varies with the different structures of uh, the, of 
whatever cellulose base material that we're dealing with. Um, I didn't want to get too complex with that, but just kind of mention that there are the intermolecular forces that's involved and uh, how, and how it's um, incorporated into the into how sorbents are able to separate the oil from water. Yeah, just a follow up question, Caroline. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to understand, mm -hmm. your, you know, the process of your experiment. Right. So you used several materials. I think that's a mm -hmm. uh, and. And the, absor the absorption, is that happening when you filter the, uh, you know, the, the water with oil? So are you saying that oil can be separated using that filtration process? Yes. So when we pour the oil yeah. water mixture through the, uh, the funnel mm -hmm. uh, that contains our absorbents, um, yep. the absor absorption and absorption process is taking place simultaneously. Um, so the... Um, in the teacher manual, I kind of mention like more in depth of how the adsorption and absorption process works. Um, but the reason why we're testing the three, again, is to see which is the best at um, holding the, uh, not holding, but um, absorbing the, the oil. Um, and that is mainly based on the content of the lignin because yes. hemicellulose and cellulose are both uh, hydrophilic so they're not going to be responsible for separating the oil from the water so we're relying really on the content of the lignin and then we found that the co the content of the uh, lignin is actually the is highest at about 32 percent and then uh, with the um, corn and the rice straw uh, respectively it's about 12 to 16 percent then for rice is, is 29 so then the ranking should be about coconut like in terms of the best absorbent to the worst should be coconut, rice, and then corn. Okay, thank you. You may want to consider rice husk and wire dust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions uh, for this group. So I'm sorry that you had a connection issue, um, but I hope to see you all at the closing ceremony. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. So next, we are welcoming Team 13, or the Weather Boys. So um, Weather Boys, you should have permission to screen share, so you can start doing that. But once the judges are ready for you, Leo will give you an OK. Thank you. We have all the scores, so you may begin whenever you can. Uh, so uh, we are the Weather Boys, and we'll be applying science through weather. And we will be doing that because the Philippines is, it's very important. Weather is very important to the Philippines, uh, as they have 20 typhoons a year. You can see the um, by the statistics below, the fact that you can hear 200, you can feel 240 of the 2000 earthquakes it is, of course, an extreme effect. And there is a decrease in biodiversity because of it. And the fact that climate change is expected to rise by 2.2 Celsius by 2050 is a lot. And as such, we have chosen these sustainable development goals. So the sustainable development goals we chose were climate action and life on land relating to weather and how weather affects the world and how living in an area with um, inclement weather can affect how we live. So our project was to create a low cost self-constructed weather kit, including uh, tools like an anemometer, thermometer, barometer, and seismograph. Even though seismograph isn't weather, we included it because I feel like it's really relevant to the Philippines. Students would use this kit to record and make predictions about weather based on the readings and apply creative scientific thinking skills that might often not be taught in school. Um, 
I think that some of our team members, I'm very sorry, like somehow got kicked or removed from the chat. I'm just getting a message from one of them, uh, Lee Sneelan. Uh, yeah. She was removed. Yeah, she was removed from the chat for some reason. I'll okay. continue my, uh, my part though. Um, okay, so the, the first tool we used was a, uh, we made was a barometer. So construction is very simple. We're using easily accessible and reusable materials, as you can see. And uh, ties to the curriculum are uh, chemistry and physics. We have the, the Boyle's Law, so PVNRT equals NRT. Um, uh, directly ties into the curriculum. It can be uh, dialed up or down based on complexity. You can talk about introducing pressure or go up to this uh, using explaining this equation, which is a more complex uh, concept. And then on the next slide, we see the picture of um, the, the our version, what we made, so it was really easy to make and you can use, so we use, uh, you can use a jar, a glass, as you can see the straw can be replaced with a stick or a noodle or anything like that. So, and then uh, we also made a thermometer. Uh, the thermometer, once again, uh, easy to access reusable materials and the curriculum tie-ins here are also uh, Play in very well with uh, what was given uh, in the curriculum. We have physics, so expansion of materials due to uh, temperature um, and uh, you know expansion condensation. Uh, general science, so here we can talk about statistics and measurements, quantitative or qualitative, uh, based on the data they obtain. And uh, chemistry, so properties of matter again, expansion condensation based on uh, temperature, and that ties into the Boyle's Law as well. And again, we have a picture of the version we made. So it was really easy to do. Yep. Uh, great. So <laughs> next up, our other tool is an anemometer uh, to measure wind speed. Again, very easy to construct, as you can see with the cups down there. In terms of curricular connections, um, you know, we're measuring wind speed. So you can talk about the earth science and uh, the physics behind that. Um, you know, where wind comes from, what causes it, this kind of stuff. Um, and also a creative application of math and measurement. Um, you know, are you gonna be measuring in cups per second? We have in our instructions um, to create a creative way uh, to measure these things while considering things like uh, inaccuracies, inaccuracies, significant figures and stuff. And in our next slide, you see what that looks like for us. Um, and then on our next slide, uh, we have a seismograph, again, very straightforward um, and dealing with topics of uh, earth science and again, physics in a more tangible physical way, um, particularly introducing things like earthquakes and plate tectonics. Uh, there's our version there. So um, learning and reflections. So the hardest thing for us was balancing feasibility and how interesting an experiment seemed. And um, because of that, we had to ensure that the materials used were accessible in the Philippines. And as you can see from below, when making the thermometer, we ran into a few issues with making the seal. And with the cups, we ran into a few issues with uh, fitting the straws into the ones which spin. So Thank you. Future, your time is up. Right. Uh, I did pause it uh, for a bit during your reconnection, but right. uh, your time is actually up now. All right. Uh, All right. Judges, do we have questions, Izzy? Hi there, it's Izzy. I, I really liked uh, seeing the physical manifestations of these different instruments. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, um, you know, my thinking is, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of these things sort of out there and I have a couple of school age kids. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've been seeing these, I've been seeing, you know, um, examples of these out in the curriculum. Was there anything where you sort of did some innovation or, or you sort of thought of a new way of doing this? So, just curious if you if you sort of evolved some of these tools. A lot of the resources we used, we subbed for resources that are really commonly recycled objects. So we tried to sub as many like uh, like plastic cups and the water bottles as those are like one of the most common waste objects you can find in any like any country anywhere. So using as many of those as possible and making the like building of it really dynamic and allowing for a lot of like uh, adaptability. As like we talked about barometer, you can use a straw, you can use a stick anything like that, you can anemometer, you can use any cups you can find. So just tying it in with sustainability and making it more usable for anyone in any community is, that's kind of how we thought to innovate. Okay, thank you.
Any other questions from the judging panel? Lisa or Ruby? Yeah, I oh, echo yeah. Lisa's question. That's, yeah. Yeah, it, I've seen many of these, but I guess um, Yasmin, or sorry, it's not Yasmin, but you clarified it. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, you know, myself being a science educator, I spent 14 years in the classroom. So um, I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, with your designs in particular, what kind of data were you able to actually obtain? And how were you at, how, how is the activity um, going to enhance understanding um, of why these measurements are important for the sustainable development goals? that you've identified? Um, so I think uh, a cool thing with that, um, that, you know, we were thinking about, okay, when you have something like um, the anemometer is my favorite, you know, you've got cups spinning around, basically, you're not going to have like a, you know, kilometers per hour readout or anything like that. And you're not going to have a really, um, you know, objective, whatever that means, uh, measurement for any of these, these are going to be things that um, you need to think about calibration and accuracy and these kinds of things that um, I think you talk about all the way uh, through through like loads of levels of science. Um, and so what we tried to be really intentional about in our, uh, our teacher's manual and the instructions for setup and uh, including the setup of like uh, tables to, to measure uh, any kind of readouts is thinking about that and thinking, uh, you know, in our questions for the discussion, uh, what are the limitations here? Where, where do you know you have inaccuracies and what does that mean for the data you're collecting? So that's kind of something I, I really enjoy about this is that it's not objective and uh, thinking about what that means and what that means for your data. And then um, just to connect it to the uh, idea of what it means to, uh, for, for the sustainable development goals, I think the big thing is connecting um, you know, starting from a baseline of like understanding and starting to think, um, you know, taking abstract thinking into like the physical to try to have a good conception of, of these ideas. And then when we start to learn about how things like climate change uh, impact weather patterns, uh, that can start to make sense in a more uh, concrete way, I guess was our hope. Yeah. Also including improving accessibility to ways to measure these because not every resource can get like a functional mechanical anemometer. So using these really accessible tools, it helps kind of almost raise awareness that anyone can be conscious about the climate around you and can be conscious about the weather and everyone should take action and try and figure out like, what can I do? How can I measure this? Even if you have to do it in a less like qualitative way and more in a quantitative and like more observed like ratio, like how high the thermometer is it's way higher than yesterday. So that means it's definitely gonna be harder than yesterday. Yeah, so I guess all these tools, Go yeah, ahead. so yeah. like you guys said, they've all, it's not, it's nothing groundbreaking. Like all these things have been done before, but our goal was to take these and apply them in, in the context of uh, our uh, sustainability goals and where we're employing this kind of toolkit. So like in the Philippines, we're, we were trying to tie it in with there as much as possible. So they can't, don't just look at them as uh, for what they are, but uh, so learn, take these like objective uh, concepts, you can say like this science learning. So from chemistry, physics, whatever, all the points we mentioned and apply them to their specific situation. And also like getting the kids to think creatively on how to make up uh, these units of measurements for themselves will hopefully help them think scientifically and creatively about solving the problems that they see themselves. Because for example, I've never been to the Philippines, but the kids have grown up there. And if they already are thinking creatively about scientific solutions, scientific ways to measure things, it just creates a good pattern of thought. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, we'll ask you to wait a while and then we'll see you all at the closing ceremony. So thank you again. Thank you again for your time uh, right, that you, you put in. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'll ask the judges to enter their scores while the next team gets ready. All right. OK. Should we leave? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 So I have just led in the next team, which is team 14, also known as Eco Crew. Um, so Eco Crew, you should have permission to screen share, so you can start doing that whenever. 
Otherwise, they're just waiting for the judges to finish scoring the previous team. So Leo will give you the okay as soon as you're ready to go. All the scores are in, so you can go whenever you uh, can. All right, hello, we are Team Eco Crew. Uh, my name is Chirag, I'm joined by Kanza, Ramsha, and Raj. Uh, together, we wanna to talk more about the Philippines and its marine plastic problem. Uh, 60 billion plastic sachets every year are thrown away. 81% of the plastic waste is mismanaged and it's the third biggest plastic polluter in the world. And a lot of this plastic ends up in the oceans harming marine life. Uh, we want to tackle a few uh, sustainable development goals, clean water and sanitation, life underwater, responsible consumption and production, and we hope our project that I'll explain in a bit will tackle the curriculum for grade 11s and 12s, fluid mechanics, DC circuits, natural hazards, mitigation, and adaptations. So basically an innovative idea that uh, an Australian company had for this marine plastic issue was the sea bin. Now, the sea bin is basically a waste bin for the ocean that collects plastic waste, uh, which can then be cleared by workers. A general design for the sea bin is as such. Uh, this yellow here represents a fabric or a mosquito net or a mesh, uh, which acts as a filter for plastic. So dirty water or plastic polluted water runs through this filter. Uh, plastic gets caught up in this filter and clean water enters this re uh, black reservoir around the mesh. Uh, this white pipe then pumps the clean water back out into the water body via this pink uh, water pump here. Now that's the general design for the sea bin. Inspired by the sea bin, we decided to create a few different prototypes uh, that could work based on uh, different applications and different material availabilities in the schools that we're going to. Uh, in all these prototypes, the filter stays the same. There's a fabric or a mosquito net as acting as a filter up here. Uh, this plastic water bottle is our reservoir uh, for clean water, and this rubber tube is the inlet uh, for uh, our water pump. So our first prototype uses a propeller to pull water out through uh, this pipe and out through the outflow using a DC motor and a battery and this plastic reservoir here. Uh, this is what it looks like in real life. Uh, up here on our left is the filter, and then on the bottom, our motor. Our second prototype uses a bottle cap and an aluminum can uh, as, a homemade as a homemade water pump. Uh, as you can see here, this is the general design. Uh, this can also be attached to the bottom of our filter and our plastic reservoir to pump water out uh, and create a suction in our sea bin. Uh, this is what that looks like in real life. We have our propeller in the middle and then all closed up with our DC motor. Our, our third prototype uh, uses a commercial submersible water pump, uh, widely available in pet stores and uh, other mechanical shops. Uh, this is meant for bigger water bodies if a student or a class wants to take it out into their community and use it. It has greater precision and accuracy, uh, so it, it just works better than the other ones. Uh, sorry, and I will hand it over to Raj for our live demonstration. All right, just want to confirm whether you guys can hear me. Are we good I to go? I can hear you, yeah. All right, so this is our live demo setup. We have the sea bin over here with the plastic. I've just added a rock here just to make sure that it's as buoyant as I would like. It's connected to two batteries and an on off switch and it goes directly into the water. I've prepared some uh, pencil shavings just to demonstrate the sucking capabilities. So I'm gonna turn it on. And as you can see, it sucks in water and it's just sucking in, uh, as it sucks in water, it brings together all the pollutants into it. And over time, most of these would get caught in the net and the water that it's sucking is being ejected out of the pipe below back into the reservoir. So it was just collected. That is our live demo. And just creating this project and doing this, I've, I haven't been as challenged in my entire university career as I have been 
using this challenge. And, and when I mean by challenge, I mean creatively challenged. Every night I was thinking of the obstacles that I faced and how I can overcome them. We realized that this won't be the sole cause and fix of all the plastic polluting our, our, our oceans, but it should help the students realize that these problems are tangible, that if they come and if they think they're able to overcome and create these creative solutions that are, um, then they can apply in their own understanding. We just hope that kids can be inspired from this and then tackle larger obstacles that they may face in their life. Thank you very much. I'm happy we challenged you. Thank you. It was, it was, it was a good challenge. I really enjoyed it. All right, judges. Hi there, it's Izzy here. I'm a, I'm a patent lawyer, so I work with companies and, and inventors who are solving problems and uh, um, coming up with these incredible solutions like yours. And, and just the process you're going through is, is just fantastic to see the live demo and to see the problem solving that you're doing. And I think what you're saying about uh, showing students that the solutions can be very tangible, the problems are tangible and the solutions are tangible, but within grasp, I think that's very powerful. Um, I just just uh, want to say I'm really impressed with what you're doing here. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah, Alice here. So I wonder you demonstrated uh, very nicely how you know you you can gather the uh, the dirt or the uh, garbage, but then do you have in your installation how you now have the clean water extracted from that experiment? Um, the clean water is exiting through a pipe. And as you can see in the bottom, there are no pencil shavings. It's all collected by the net above. So mm -hmm. all the, the water that's collected in the bottom over here, if I do it, it's all clear. There's mm -hmm. no pencil shavings in this water. It's all just in this net. Okay, great. So the, if students want to see a uh, larger design, they can create a bottle, water bottle that's slightly longer just so they can see larger a volume of clean water compared mm -hmm. to the, the the garbage collected if they want to see that aspect of it. And the again, students, this, yep. Sorry, I was just gonna say, and students can also be challenged by different types of pollutants. They could be challenged by organic pollutants or oils, you know, and they can experiment with different types of filters, different types of motors uh, to try to see how they can apply this kind of general design to some problem that might be more specific to their community. So you've touched on um, you've touched on sort of the engineering design process and and some of those parts, which is which is great. But uh, recognizing that this is about learning outcomes to meet curriculum, and you mentioned those in the in your in your slide deck, um, I'm just wondering if you could speak to exactly how um, your activity connects to those expectations. Yes, I'll just pull up that slide again. Uh, so for our sustainable development goals, obviously we want to talk about clean water and sanitation, which is really important. Uh, life underwater, uh, we want to talk about um, marine life and how that's affected by microplastics and plastics in the environment. Uh, responsible consumption and production. Now, plastic is necessary for our everyday life. You know, everything runs on plastic, medical supplies, food supplies. We need to know how to responsibly produce and consume it so that we're not harming our environment. And, and we're hoping this, you know, uh, this project of ours might in, instigate a bit of that in, in the students. Uh, we wanted to talk about fluid mechanics. So how fluid uh, moves, they can, uh, so with our first, our propeller version, they can uh, do different angles of the wings that the propeller attaches to the motor. Uh, they can do different sizes of water bottles. You know, can they shorten the aperture, make the aperture larger uh, for water movement? Like they can do a lot of experiments that way. And the project can be altered to be focused on, on fluid mechanics. DC circuits, we use uh, a three volt uh, motor with a three volt battery pack. They can use a six volt motor. They can talk about rotations, they can use gearboxes to reduce uh, rotations, they can talk about voltage and power. Um, natural hazards, we can talk about um, plastic pollution, how that affects marine life, mitigational adaptations, again, uh, how can we stop, how is that, you know, plastic is going into the ocean affecting marine life, but how does that affect us? It's in our food, uh, we're, you know, bioaccumulation, we're very much at the top of the food chain, so we're not exempt from uh, the, the horrible effects that are, that are going on in the ecosystem. So kind of bringing that awareness of the physics aspect, but as well as the environmental aspect. 
I, I hope that answers the question. If you have any further, I can explain that. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just wondering specifically, like for example, you said fluid dynamics mm -hmm. and uh, it sounds like your, your exploration of these concepts is through sort of a trial and error process. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how you're actually going to get to the understanding of fluid dynamics uh, from a student perspective. One of the things that I wanted to touch on was through this process, uh, like it's it's an aspect of fluid mechanics, but um, it's a, like an off tangent was about adhesion and cohesion. Uh, I was experimenting with different materials for the pipes and I understood that, um, oh, so the uh, the pipes that are more adhesive to the water are able to form a stronger vacuum compared to something that's uh, waterproof, some waxy plastic that would just, uh, that won't uh, adhere to the actual edges. Um, the other aspect I want to talk about in terms of fluid dynamics was, as Chirag mentioned, the aperture. How would the changing the aperture of the actual hold influence the water, um, like the amount of suction that's generated? So a larger aperture may involve a larger volume of water being sucked, but it may um, decrease the rate. So talking about pressure in that aspect, talking about Q, the total flow volume. Um, so we can add some mathematical uh, uh, additions to this if it's necessary. But we were focusing also, more on the engineering aspect. Thank you very yeah. much. We're, the time is up. Okay, perfect. But uh, thank you very much for that presentation and for your hard work uh, this weekend or and last weekend as well. So uh, we're going to have the other group come in now. So thank you very much. I'll see you at the closing ceremony. Thank have you. a good day, guys. Goodbye. And this is a good time to enter the scores, judges. Thank you. And, so uh, we are now welcoming Team 16, known as the Corn Queens. Uh, so to the Corn Queens, you should be able to start sharing your screen, but the judges are just inputting their scores. So Leo will give you the thumbs up when you're ready to go. All right, so Corn Queens, whenever you're ready. Uh, hello, we are Team 16, the Corn Queens, presenting our Crystal Radio project. My name is Mashiat, and I'll be doing this presentation. So before we start, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll start with introducing why we chose to build the ra Crystal Radio and its importance and relevance for students in the Philippines. Uh, three problem, major problems that we want to address for these uh, uh, in the Philippines are the lack of access to reliable internet, and then frequent power outages, inequalities in access to education. We believe that a lack of communication plays a large role when tackling these problems. So what's our solution? Project Crystal Radio that aims to build an inexpensive communication system that can be used for education in remote areas without the use of electricity. So how does this project meet up with the goals we, you've actually mentioned, uh, you've given us? So the, we are targeting UN's SDGs um, four and seven. This project aims to promote public education and can be shared uh, within remote communities and it teaches students about clean and affordable energy as well as the materials for this project can be found from recycling, found at home or even bought cheaply in the market. As you can see in this list of uh, materials, the, there are parts like the germanium diode, the buzzer, the wires, as well as the resistor. These can be sourced through electronic waste or be cheaply found in local shops. Otherwise, the rest of the materials are, as mentioned, are found at home. So here's a schematic of the circuit, uh, uh, how we can build it. And it is important to note that for the antenna, we will use the thicker gauge wire so that we don't lose current due to resistance. And now here's Jessica, my teammate with the live demonstration. 
Okay, hey guys, thank you Mashiach for the introduction. Um, so unfortunately, I won't be able to show you guys audio from the radio um, because of the fact that I live next to a busy street and my phone won't be able to pick up audio because um, it's rather quiet. Um, however, I will be able to show you guys how I have the radio set up in my dorm room. So let me switch the camera over. So yeah, here's the finished radio. Um, essentially for how we tune it, uh, we adjust the capacitor here. And most of it, it's usually easier just to set the capacitor to a certain length. And then you just move the, you move the tuning guide wire along the top of the solenoid. And the solenoid, you can effectively change the length of the, the number of turns in the solenoid by um, connecting it to ground, which is what the, which is where the tuning guide wire is connected to. So in order to listen to the radio, you just put this piece against your ear and then you move this tuning guide wire along until you eventually pick up a signal. Uh, for ground, I have it connected over to my electrical outlet here. Not sure if you guys can see that, but anyway, it's connected to the ground plug. And then for the antennas, I have three connected to my state to my radio. It's mainly because I my dorm room is essentially a concrete bunker and I have trouble picking up signal. And yeah, it's just trailed across my floor and that's about it. I'll let Masha take the lead again. Thanks, Jessica. So the science behind it. So the radio is powered by induction and as radio waves pass to the antenna and it, uh, it generates an alternating current, which is then um, fed into the smaller coil, which then generates an alternative, uh, alternating magnetic field. And we can get away with a single coil system, but having a second adjustable coil in with that is parallel to the capacitor gives a gives us a greater selectivity through a process or the effect known as resonance. And adjusting the capacitance and the number of coils in the second coils by using this uh, tuning bar, uh, it can change the frequency that radio is tuned to right now. And the diode here changes the AC current generated by the coils to DC, which is then fed into the earpiece. Not to mention there is a, a resistor that allows current, a small amount of current to trickle backwards to prevent uh, charge buildup of, on one side of the um, earpiece, which would prevent it from working. And the earpiece is a piezoelectric uh, the crystal, these which deform when put under a potential, and it converts um, electrical energy in the circuit to mechanical energy in the form of sound so that so your user can hear information encode, encoded in the radio waves. So what can we uh, what can be learned from this project? Here we have a list of physics concepts that students will gain a be better understanding of, and of course how to build their own radio. Thank you so much for listening. Any questions? Good timing. All Thanks. right, judges. I have a clarification. Um, oh I, yes. I, I, I think at the introduction, you mentioned about um, access, uh, like giving remote access to education. I did not quite see the connection. Can you like explain yeah, it further? So, yeah, so for uh, your question, um, so what we would be teaching students is um, we can use a radio communication system in order to deliver classes through the radio. So students would be able to, you know, stay at home and listen um, to classes being broadcasted rather than, you know, having to travel very far to go to school and um, whatnot. So just a clarification again. So in a way, it's like they get just the audio, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions from judges? Yeah, just to continue with what Ruby just uh, asked. So this is a radio where, you know, you can also hear some music, like with you have something like an AM on a, or an yeah. FM. Uh, channels there and uh, uh, yeah and have you tried that like uh, have you uh, checked whether the radio that you have built um, you know in the signal that you're getting was able to get signals from a certain radio station here uh, I didn't I when I was trying to use the radio I pretty much just checked if it actually if it picked up the signal I didn't check for a specific signal but I'm pretty sure with something angling, you could figure 
you could probably change the number of turns or the capacitance. Um, and then you could probably figure out how to, um, you could probably find the exact, um, the exact radio station. Um, in our teacher's manual, we also have instructions on how to calculate, um, how to find the exact radio station basically. Yeah, just another follow up, like you were yeah. targeting for remote areas in the Philippines, like remote communities. Like I wonder whether signal can reach that area. And so, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so wondering where the radio could, you know, provide that signal. AM uh, radio like frequencies are usually sent for long distance areas. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even if you're like 100, 200 kilometers away, you should be able to pick up a signal. That's why we specifically said AM because the AM uh, waves are like long distance Lower, waves. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Lisa or Izzy, you still have some, some time. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Corn Queens. Okay. Thank you. So thank you for having too. us. Cheers. Uh, so we'll bring in the next team and uh, come join us for the closing ceremony, and that's when we'll uh, hand out the awards. Okay. Thank okay. Thanks for your Thanks time so much, and your work. Thank you so much, judges, Thank as you. well. Thank you. Give some time for the judges to enter their score. We're running a, a little early. So. so this will be the last team prior to break. And uh, since we're uh, waiting on them, I'll just like to uh, thank our sponsors for our event uh, once again. So uh, we had really good support from Manual Life, MBNA, and TD Insurance uh, through the University of Toronto Pillar Sponsorship uh, Program, as well as um, from the best program at York University. Um, and for anybody who's watching the stream right now, after the next group goes, we will be pausing the stream for about 20 minutes and uh, we will resume at three o'clock. We're just waiting for the next group to check in. Thank you for the scores, judges. Quick question for you, Leo. So what is behind you? What is the image that, where does the image come from? I'm just oh, curious. This was, you know, back when we were allowed to travel. Uh, earlier yes. in January, I actually stopped by the United Nations building and they had all the banners of the uh, SDGs. And That's so, extremely cool. <laughs> So I think the next team uh, has come in. Are you guys missing anybody still? I think you only have three members in right now. Um, I don't see Rui. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, we can wait one more minute um, for them. If you guys have any slides, you can start sharing screens. Um, get that ready to go. But uh, yeah, just, just to note, uh, if you want to show a live demonstration, please turn off your share screen so your live demonstration video can be larger. Is that working? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I think Rui is joining right now. So as soon as you guys are ready, you can start presenting. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm... Sydney, I'm representing team one, uh, the rubber duckies, and I will be speaking about our activity, Quake No More. So first, a little background. Uh, the, Phil the Philippines is located in the Pacific Ring of Fire, causing it to be extremely prone to earthquakes. Um, as we all know, earthquakes can cause extensive damage, not only to property, but it can also result to enormous loss of life. These issues can be mitigated um, through an understanding of the physics behind earthquakes and building response, specifically by looking at resonance and damping. So when the ground shakes, it causes buildings to shake as well. And then when the building reaches its resonance, that's when the, the most damage occurs. 
So specifically, buildings can be compared to cantilever beams, and this will allow students to be exposed to the math behind calculating natu natural frequency, um, which is dependent on the mass, the stiffness, and mainly the height of the building. Um, as well, we're going to um, in include some other science topics related to reinforcement materials and different types of soils in the activity. So for the purpose of the activity, these concepts will be um, recreated using simple models that will allow students to visualize a building's response to earthquakes, as well as the effect that a building's configuration has on its response. Here we're using a lollipop-like model that is simple and easy to visualize, but also demonstrates an accurate response. Um, as you can see in the picture, um, in our slide, there are three different uh, configurations that we're gonna be focusing on for the activity. The first is to demonstrate the difference that a height has, um, the effect that the height has of models of the building's response, sorry. And the second activity, the two of them will be focused on damping. The first using a mass and the second using a support that kind of widens the structure and also recreates a more uh, realistic visualization of how the buildings are actually created. So the materials in this activity are readily available and inexpensive, as well as easy to assemble. Here's the list. We have wooden beams, a wooden beam, wooden or bamboo dowels, slim wooden blocks, string, yarn, large washers and bolts for the damping, elastic bands and optional paint and paintbrushes for the students to decorate the model after the activity is completed. So now we have a quick demonstration to be completed by Elizabeth. So if you could turn your attention to her screen, um, that would be great. All right, so here you see that our model, just like in the previous slides. So my taller building here, if I uh, imitate an earthquake by shaking my beam back and forth, I can see that I've hit resonance at a pretty low frequency. And then if I shake the ground a lot quicker, I can hit resonance of the shorter building where my taller building stays quite stationary. So we can talk about uh, how the resonance can be really detrimental to buildings because as you can see, it shakes a lot more violently when I hit the resonant frequency of my structure. So we'd want to encourage kids to uh, think of innovative ways to prevent buildings from hitting that resonance during an earthquake. And one way to do that is by damping the structure. So we can show that by pulling our structure back without any weight. We can see how long it takes for the structure to be, to be stationary once more after shaking. So if I add my weight here, I'm going to see how it is damped and it will come to its uh, standstill position a lot faster than it did without the weight. So I'm just threading uh, this weight through the holes on the side of my block. And now if I pull it back, it becomes stationary a lot quicker. So the damping is helping to, uh, to prevent the shaking that we saw before. Another way to damp is by adding some reinforcements. So I have one pre-made here. So if I just switch out uh, my dowels, I've just added some extra reinforcing struts just attached with some elastic bands here. So if I put my weight back on the top and try to shake it, I won't be able to hit resonance as easily as I was able to before. So if I shake this back and forth, you're seeing it's not shaking that much, or at least I hope you can see that in the video. Um, so it's definitely a great way to reinforce your buildings to prevent them from being damaged so much with the earthquakes. Um, okay, so finally, we just wanted to touch on the um, sustainable development goals that we were talking about. If my, sorry, if my screen is sharing properly. Uh, so we just wanted to mention quality education, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and sustainable communities and cities, just um, for students to use their knowledge to try and learn about the different ways that people address earthquakes and how buildings respond to them. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Hi, hi there, it's Izzy. I really like your presentation. I really like how simple and, and uh, straightforward and, and uh, is, I could just imagine, you know, kids really taking a lot from that. I'm wondering if it's possible to, you know, do anything more around visualizing the strains. Like I understand sort of the basic concept of resonance creating kind of that, that damage conditions, but I'm wondering if there, if you thought of any sort of extensions into maybe um, learning about strains and stresses on particular parts of the structures just to, you know, as sort of a second part of the education. Um, it just sort of cries out for a little bit more, uh, a little bit more to kind of hang off the main concept, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that comes to mind straight away is the idea that the 
the beams that I'm using, like the dowel sword here, they they kind of warp as you use them. So um, you can kind of, you could visualize it that way because they kind of get like this like curved shaped in them a little bit. So you can see how um, some of the fibers of that wood have kind of uh, broken from the stress of that shaking. Mm. So you could maybe connect uh, that even to buildings because maybe they've been in multiple earthquakes and then they don't hit resonance, they still are damaged slightly. So you could um, talk- Right, like over time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you could talk yeah. about those connections and shear forces and all the different kinds of forces. Like I think it'd just be a great opportunity to, to kind of talk about, you know, that, that world essentially, because it is, it, you get into structural design, there, there's so much there. So it's, yeah. it's a great opportunity, I think, to, to deepen some of those concepts. Definitely. I have a question. Um, I see that, uh, I, I mean, I think your, your activity is, is great in terms of the simplicity of introducing some some key uh, physics concepts that are connected to curriculum, um, but kind of um, extending on your on the previous question, I'm just wondering because this activity seems to be quite uh, teacher led, in that you know there's a model they're specifically designing around to explore these you know constrained variables, and I'm wondering if they're if in um, your you know uh, lesson design if there were things that were student uh, inquiry driven. Um, as an extension to what they're learning. We tried to have some leading questions with, do you experience any, or can you think of any examples of resonance in your life? Um, we're also um, wanting to open it up for the kids to just kind of play with the model. Like, yes, you're supposed to shake it in a certain way and all that stuff, but just you could add different weights to it and see like, does more weight help? Or like, how does more weight or less weight impact um, the structure with in terms of damping and you can explore it that way um, and just kind of have the teacher introduce it but allow the kids to kind of explore what they're seeing with the model. Yeah and um, just to expand on that a little bit um, within the teacher's manual at least we made sure that um, the way this activity is done is very student friendly wherein before any demonstration is done um, students are asked what are some ways that you can think of based on what you've learned in class that you could reduce the resonance and then we proceed with the demonstration and then even after we kind of go back and relate it to real life where we say okay now that we've done this activity what do you think are some ways that you can use in your own buildings um, that you see around around town um, to kind of reduce the resonance and to think about that earthquake um, proof buildings um, and we've also again in the teacher's manual we've also incorporated some math we've provided the equation for the cantilever beam um, so students can play around with that equation um, and testing different lengths and different weights um, of the beams and um, the buildings thank you we have time for one more question before the break so uh, i have a just uh, yeah, one question. Um, so I'm I, number one. Of course, I'm really happy to see your your demonstration. It's very engaging. I, I could imagine the kids would love it. It's very intuitive, I must say, um, and easy to 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 follow. Um, this could be a more my question could be more engineering slash construction. But I was just wondering when you were designing your experiment or the your your innov you were designing the the activity. Did you take into account, let's say, the type of soil in relation to the material you are like putting? So would the dowel work if I, I don't know, I have like a sand or, yeah, I mean, this could be some details, but could you comment on that? Yes, yeah, so we tried, we um, were experimenting with a lot of different things to hold the blocks, but we just came back to wood just because with how hard you have to shake it, soil, like the rocks and the sand that we tried to use would kind of mold to how the stick would want to, move and it wouldn't hold the building upright because it's very different when with the earth it's very it's packed really tight and you can drill the pillars a lot deeper into the ground because once we added too much sand it was really hard to shake the structure back and forth so we we were trying our best to try and incorporate that but we just weren't able to find something that would work uh, we did include in the teacher's manual some comments about that so they could hopefully build on that with the students and talk about how like bedrock versus more like sand would have different resonance frequencies and transmit that to the buildings a little bit different, but we weren't able to actually include that in the model. Okay, but I'm happy to hear that you did some optimization and then you included it in the teacher's manual. That's the important part. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Rubber Duckies. Uh, you did a great presentation and you did a lot of work the, uh, these past two weekends. So um, you can head out right now. We'll be back. Uh, I'll, we'll see you guys at the closing ceremony. And for anybody on the Twitch stream, uh, we will be pausing the stream right now and uh, we will be back at three o'clock. So uh, tune in, in the same URL. We'll start the stream again. I'll ask the judges to remain on the video um, and see you in a bit. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you.